Book the Fourth, Chapter Four of Charlotte's Inheritance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Charlotte's Inheritance by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter Four. Sharper than a serpent's tooth. Having pledged herself to visit Omega Street on Thursday, Diana considered herself bound to perform that promise. She felt, however, that there was some touch of absurdity in the position, for to keep a promise so made was, in a manner, to keep an appointment with Monsieur Lenoble. "'I dare say he has a habit of falling in love with every young woman he meets,' she thought, when she considered his conduct from a more prosaic standpoint than the grateful enthusiasm his generous sympathy had at first awakened in her mind i have heard that it is a frenchman's faculty to consider himself irresistible and to avow his adoration for a new divinity every week and i was so foolish as to fancy there was a depth of feeling in his tone and manner i am sure he is all that is good and generous but the falling in love is no doubt a national failing she remembered the impertinent advances of diverse unknown foreigners whom she had encountered on pier cursal or beach in the frequently unprotected hours of her continental wanderings she had not seen the best side of the foreign mind in her character of unattended and doubtfully attired english demoiselle she knew that gustave lenoble was of a very different stamp from those specimens of the genus tiger whose impertinent admiration had often wounded and distressed her but she was inclined to attribute the fault of shallowness to a nature so frank and buoyant as that of her father's friend she walked from bayswater to chelsea on the appointed thursday for the cost of frequent journeys in cabs was more than her purse could supply the walk across the park was pleasant even in the bleak march weather and she entered the little parlour in omega street with the bloom of damask roses upon her cheeks how do you do papa dear she began as she came into the dusky room but the figure sitting in her father's accustomed place was not that of her father it was m lenoble who rose to welcome her is papa worse she asked surprised by the captain's absence on the contrary he is better and has gone out in a hired carriage for a breath of fresh air i persuaded him to go he will be back very shortly i wrote to tell him i should be here to-day but i am very glad he has gone out for i am sure the air will do him good was he well wrapped up do you know monsieur lenoble enveloped in railway rugs and shawls to his very nose i arranged all that with my own hands he looked like an ambassador from all the rushes how kind of you to think of such things said diana gratefully and tell me why should i not think of such things do you imagine that it is not a pleasure to me to wait upon your father for your sake there was some amount of awkwardness in this kind of thing diana busied herself with the removal of her hat and jacket which she laid neatly upon a stony-hearted horsehair sofa after doing this she placed herself near the window whence she contemplated the dusky street appearing much interested in the movements of the lamplighter what an admirable way they have of lighting the lamps now she remarked with the conversational brilliance which usually marks this kind of situation how much more convenient it must be than the old method with the ladder you know yes i have no doubt said gustave bringing himself to her side with a couple of steps and planting himself deliberately in a chair next to hers but don't you think as i start for normandy to-morrow we might talk of something more interesting than the lamplighter miss paget i am ready to talk of anything you like replied miss paget with that charming assumption of unconsciousness which every woman can command on these occasions you are very good do you know that when i persuaded your father to go out for an airing i was prompted by a motive so selfish as to render the proceeding quite diabolical don't be alarmed the doctor gave his permission for the airing or i should not have attempted such a thing 
hypocrisy i am capable of but not assassination you cannot imagine the diplomacy which i exhibited and all to what end can you imagine that no indeed that i might secure one half hour's uninterrupted talk with you and unhappily you are so late that i expect your father's return every minute he was to be back again before dusk and the appearance of the lamplighter demonstrates that the dusk has come i have so much to say and so little time to say it so much diane she started as he called her thus as if in that moment of surprise she would have risen from her chair by his side she knew what was coming and having expected nothing so desperate knew not how to arrest the confession that she would fain have avoided hearing m lenoble laid his hand firmly on hers so much diane and yet so little that all can be told in three words i love you m lenoble ah you are surprised you wonder you look at me with eyes of sweet amazement dear angel do you think it is possible to see you and not to love you to see you once is to respect to admire to bow the knee before beauty and goodness but to see you many times as i have done the patient consoler of an invalid and somewhat difficult father ah my sweet love who is there so hard amongst mankind that he should escape from loving you seeing all that the question had a significance that the speaker knew not who amongst mankind why was there not one man for whom she would have been content to be the veriest slave that ever abnegated every personal delight for the love of a hard master and he had passed her by indifferent unseeing she had worshipped him on her knees as it seemed to her and he had left her kneeling in the dust while he went on to offer himself heart and soul at another shrine she could not forget these things the memory and the bitterness of them came back with renewed poignancy at this moment when the voice of a stranger told her she was beloved my dear one will you not answer me pleaded gustave in no wise alarmed by diana's silence which seemed to him only the natural expression of a maidenly emotion tell me that you will give me measure for measure that you will love me as my mother loved my father with a love that trouble and poverty could never lessen with a love that was strongest when fate was darkest a star which the dreary night of sorrow could not obscure i am ten years older than you by my baptismal register diane but my heart is young i never knew what love was until i knew you and yet those who know me best will tell you that i was no unkind husband and that my poor wife and i lived happily i shall never know love again except for you the hour comes i suppose in every man's life and the angel of his life comes in that appointed hour mine came when i saw you i have spoken to your father and have his warm approval he was all encouragement and hinted that i might be assured of your love had he sufficient justification for that half-promise diane he had none miss paget answered gravely none except his own wishes you have made me hear more than i wished to hear monsieur lenoble for the treasure you offer me is one that i cannot accept with all my heart i thank you for the love you tell me of even if it is as i can but think it a passing fancy i thank you nevertheless it is sweet to win the love of a good man i pray you to believe that with all my heart and mind i honour your generous nature your noble sympathy with the weak and friendless if you can give me your friendship you shall find how i can value a good man's regard but i cannot accept your love why not asked gustave aghast because i cannot give you measure for measure and i will not give you less but in time diane in time time cannot show me your character in a nobler light than that in which i see it now you do not lack the power to win a woman's heart but i have no heart to give if you will be my friend time will increase my affection for you but time cannot restore the dead which means that your heart is dead diane 
yes she answered with unutterable sadness you love someone younger happier than i no monsieur lenoble no one but you have loved yes a scoundrel perhaps a villain who a spasm of pain contracted his face as he looked at the girl's drooping head her face in that dim light he could not see tell me this diane he said presently in an altered voice there is no barrier between us no irrevocable obstacle that must part us for ever there was no one who can claim you by any right he paused and then added in a lower voice by any wrong no one answered miss paget lifting her head and looking her lover full in the face even in that uncertain light he could see the proud steady gaze that seemed the fittest answer of all doubts thank god he whispered ah how could i fear even for one moment that you could be anything but what you seem the purest among the pure why then do you reject me you do not love me but you ask my friendship you offer me your friendship even your affection ah believe me if those are but real time will ripen them into love your heart is dead ah why should that young heart be dead it is not dead diane it needs but the fire of true love to warm it into life again why should you reject me since you tell me that you love me unless you love another what should divide us shadows and memories diana replied mournfully vague and foolish wicked perhaps but they come between you and me monsieur lenoble and since i cannot give you a whole heart i will give you nothing you have loved some one some one who did not value your love tell me the truth diane you owe me at least as much as that i do owe you the truth yes i have been very foolish for two or three years of my life there was a person who was our daily companion he travelled with us with my father and me and we saw many changes and troubles together for a long time he was like my brother and i doubt if many brothers are as kind to their sisters as he was to me in his heart that feeling never changed he was always equally kind equally careless once i deluded myself with the fancy that in his look and tones and even in his words there was some deeper feeling than this careless brotherly kindness but it was no more than a delusion my eyes were opened rudely enough i saw his heart bestowed elsewhere do not think that i am so weak or so wicked as to abandon myself to despair because i have been awakened from my foolish dream i can look the realities of life in the face monsieur lenoble and i have taught myself to wish all good things for the dear girl who has won the heart that i once thought was mine the person i am speaking of can boast no superior graces of mind or person he is only a very commonplace young man with a certain amount of talent a disposition inclined to good rather than to evil but he was the companion of my girlhood and in losing him it seems to me as if i had lost a part of my youth itself to diana's mind this seemed to end the discussion she expected monsieur lenoble to bow his head to the inevitable to utter a friendly farewell and depart for his norman home convinced if not satisfied but the light-hearted easy-tempered gustave was not a lover of the despairing order nor an easily answered suppliant and that is all he exclaimed in the cheeriest tone a companion of your girlhood for whom you had a girl's romantic fancy and the memory of this unspeakable idiot great heaven but how idiotic must this wretch have been to be loved by you and not even to know it the memory of this last of the last is to come between you and me and divide us for ever the phantom of this miserable who could be loved by an angel without knowing it is to lift its phantasmal hand and thrust me aside me gustave lenoble a man and not an idiot ah thus we blow him to the uttermost end of the world cried m lenoble blowing an imaginary rival from the tips of his fingers thus we dismiss him to the arctic regions the torrid zone to the caucasus where await vultures to gnaw his liver 
wherever earth is most remote and uncomfortable he and the bread-and-butter miss whom he prefers to my diane this manner of taking things was quite unexpected by a diana it was much more pleasant than gloomy despair or sullen resentment but it was at the same time much more difficult to deal with he is gone cried gustave presently he is on the topmost heights of caucasus and the vultures are sharpening their beaks and now tell me diane you will be my wife will you not you will be a mother to my children you will transform the old chateau of cotonnois into a pleasant home you will cease to live amongst strangers you will come to those who will love and cherish you as their own their dearest and best and brightest you will give your poor old father a corner by your fireside he is old and needs a home for his last years for his sake diane for mine for my children let your answer be yes ah not so fast he cried as she was about to speak why are you so quick to pronounce your fatal judgment think how much depends on your reply your father's happiness my children's mine it is of yours only i must think miss paget answered earnestly you fancy it is so easy for me to say no believe me it would be much easier to say yes when you speak of my father's declining years i who know his weary life so well would be hard of heart indeed if i were not tempted by the haven you offer every word that you say gives me some new proof of your goodness your generosity but i will not wrong you because you are generous i shall always be your grateful friend but you must seek elsewhere for a wife monsieur lenoble you will have little difficulty in finding one worthier than i i will seek nowhere else for a wife i will have no wife but you i have had a wife of other people's choosing i will choose one for myself this time let us be friends diane since your decision is as irrevocable as the laws of draco you are stone you are adamant but no matter we can be friends your father will be disappointed but what then he is no doubt accustomed to disappointments my daughters for them it is a profound affliction to be motherless but they must support it cotonnois must go to wreck and ruin a little longer a few more rats behind the panelling a few more moths in the tapestry that is all my children say papa our home is not comfortable all is upside down and i reply but what will you my children a home without a wife is always upside down and then i take them between my arms in weeping it is a poignant picture to rend the heart but what does it matter miss paget what is that verse of your grand will blow blow thou wintry wind and let go weep the stricken land while hearts ungalled go play perhaps i have mixed him up somehow but the meaning is clear a hollow sounding and somewhat awful cough heralded the approach of captain paget who entered the room at this juncture if the captain had prolonged his first airing after six weeks confinement to the house until this late period of the afternoon he would have committed an imprudence which might have cost him dearly happily he had done nothing of the kind but had re-entered the house unobserved while diana and gustave were conversing close to the window having preferred to leave his fly at the end of the street rather than to incur the hazard of interrupting a critical tete-a-tete -tete. the interval that had elapsed since his return had been spent by the captain in his own bedchamber and in the immediate neighbourhood of the folding doors between that apartment and the parlour what he had heard had been by no means satisfactory to him and if a look could annihilate miss paget might have perished beneath the parthian glance which her father shot at her when he came towards the window with a stereotyped smile upon his lips and unspeakable anger in his heart he had heard just enough of the conversation to know that gustave had been rejected gustave with cotonnois and a handsome independence in the present and the late john haygarth's fortune in the future rejected by a penniless young woman who at any moment might find herself without a roof to shelter her from the winds of heaven was ever folly madness wickedness supreme as this 
Horatio trembled with rage as he took his daughter's hand. She had the insolence to extend her hand for the customary salutation. The captain's greeting was a grip that made her wince. "'Good night, Miss Paget,' said Gustave gravely, but with by no means the despondent tone of a hopeless lover. "'I... well, I shall see you again, perhaps, before I go to Normandy. I doubt if I shall go to-morrow. I have my own reasons for staying. Unreasonable reasons, perhaps, but I shall stay.' All this was said in a tone too low to reach Captain Paget's ear. "'Are you going to leave us, Lenoble?' he asked in a quavering voice. "'You will not stop and let Di give you a cup of tea as usual?' "'Not to-night, Captain. Good night.' He wrung the old man's hand and departed. Captain Paget dropped heavily into a chair, and for some minutes there was silence. Diana was the first to speak. "'I am glad your doctor considered you well enough to go out for a drive, papa,' she said. "'Indeed, my dear,' answered the father with a groan. "'I hope my next drive may be in a different kind of vehicle. "'The last journey I shall ever take until they cart away my bones for manure. "'I believe they do make manure from the bones of paupers in our utilitarian age.' "'Papa, how can you talk so horribly? "'You are better, are you not?' Monsieur Lenoble said you were better. Yes, I am better, God help me, answered the old man, too weak alike in mind and body to hide the passion that possessed him. That is one of the contradictions of the long farce we call life. If I had been a rich man, with a circle of anxious relations and all the noted men of Savile Road dancing attendance round my bed, I dare say I should have died. But as I happen to be a penniless castaway, with only a lodging house drudge, and a half-starved apothecary to take care of me and with nothing before me but a workhouse i live it is all very well for a man to take things easily when he is ill and helpless too weak even to think that is not the trying time the real trial arrives when a little strength comes back to him and his landlady begins to worry him for the rent and the lodging-house drudge gets tired of pitying him and the apothecary sends in his bill and the wretched high road lies bare and broad before him and he hears the old order to move on the moving on time has come for me di and the lord alone knows how little i know where i am to go papa you are not friendless even i can give you a little help yes answered the captain with a bitter laugh a sovereign once a quarter the scrapings of your pittance that help won't save me from the workhouse there is monsieur lenoble yes there is monsieur lenoble the man who would have given me a home for my old age he told me so to-day a home fit for a gentleman for the position he now occupies is nothing compared to that which he may occupy a year hence he would have received me as his father-in-law without thought or question of my antecedents and if i have not lived like a gentleman i might have died like one this is what he would have done for me but do you think i can ask anything of him now after you have refused him i know of your refusal to be that man's wife i heard i saw it in his face you a beggar a friendless wretch dependent on the patronage of a stockbroker's silly wife you must needs give yourself grand airs and refuse such a man as that do you think such men go begging among young ladies like you or that they run about the streets like the roast pigs in the story begad with knives and forks in their backs asking to be eaten the captain was walking up and down the room in a fever of rage diana looked at him with sad wandering eyes yes it was the old selfish nature the leopard cannot change his spots and the horatio paget of the present was the horatio paget of the past pray don't be angry with me papa said diana sorrowfully i believe that i have done my duty done your fiddlesticks cried the captain too angry to be careful of his diction your duty to whom did you happen to remember miss that you owe some duty to me your father but for whom you wouldn't be standing there talking of duty like a tragedy queen by jove i suppose you are too grand a person to consider my trouble in this matter the pains i took to get lenoble over to england the way i made the most of my gout even in order to have you about me 
the way i finessed and diplomatized to bring this affair to a successful issue and now when i have succeeded beyond my hopes you spoil everything and then dare to stand before me and preach about duty what do you want in a husband i should like to know a rich man lenoble is that a handsome man lenoble is that a gentleman with good blood in his veins lenoble comes of as pure a race as any man in that part of france a good man lenoble is one of the best fellows upon this earth what is it then that you want i want to give my heart to the man who gives me his and what in the name of all that's preposterous is to prevent you giving gustave lenoble your heart i cannot tell you no nor any one else but let us have no more of this nonsense if you call yourself a daughter of mine you will marry gustave lenoble if not the captain found himself brought to a sudden stop in his unconscious paraphrase of signor capulet's menace to his recalcitrant daughter juliet with what threat could the noble horatio terrify his daughter to obedience before you talk of turning your rebellious child out of doors you must provide a home from which to cast her captain paget remembered this and was for the moment reduced to sudden and ignominious silence and yet there must surely be some way of bringing this besotted young woman to reason he sat for some minutes in silence with his head leaning on his hand his face hidden from diana this silence this attitude so expressive of utter despondency touched her more keenly than his anger she knew that he was mean and selfish that it was of his own loss he thought and yet she pitied him he was old and helpless and miserable so much the more pitiable because of his selfishness and meanness for the heroic soul there is always some comfort but for the grovelling nature suffering knows no counterbalance the ills that flesh is heir to seem utterly bitter when there is no grand spirit to dominate the flesh and soar triumphant above the regions of earthly pain captain paget's mind to him was not a kingdom he could not look declining years of poverty in the face he was tired of work the schemes and trickeries of his life were becoming very odious to him they were for the most part worn out and had ceased to pay of course he had great hopes in any event from gustave lenoble but those hopes were dependent on gustave's inheritance of john haygarth's estate he wanted something more tangible than this he wanted immediate security and his daughter's marriage with gustave would have given him that security and still grander hopes for the future he had fancied himself reigning over the vassals of cotonnois a far more important personage than the real master of that chateau he had pictured to himself a pied a terre in paris which it might be agreeable for him to secure for existence in normandy might occasionally prove ennuyeux these things were what he meant when he talked of a haven for his declining years and against the daughter who for some caprice of her own could hinder his possession of these things he had no feeling but anger diana compassionated this weak old man to whose lips the cup of prosperity had seemed so near from whose lips her hand had thrust it he had been promised a home comfort respectability friendship all that should accompany old age and she had prevented the fulfilment of the promise heaven knows how pure her motives had been but as she watched that drooping head with its silvered hair she felt that she had been cruel papa she began presently laying her hand caressingly upon her father's neck but he pushed aside the timid caressing hand papa you think me very unkind only because i have done what i believe to be right indeed it is so papa dear in what i said to gustave lenoble this evening i was governed only by my sense of right indeed cried the captain with a strident laugh and where did you pick up your sense of right madam i should like to know from what methodist parson's hypocritical twaddle have you learnt to lay down the law to your poor old father about the sense of right honour your father and mother that your days may be long in the land miss that's what your bible teaches you 
but the bible has gone out of fashion i dare say since i was a young man and your model young woman of the present generation taunts her father with her sense of right will your sense of right be satisfied when you hear of your father's rotting in the old men's ward of a workhouse or dying on the london stones i am not unfeeling papa with all my heart i pity you but it is cruel on your part to exaggerate the misery of your position as i am sure you must be doing why should your means of living fail because i refuse to marry monsieur lenoble you have lived hitherto without my help as i have lived of late without yours nothing could give me greater happiness than to know that you were exempt from care and if my toil can procure you a peaceful home in the future as i believe it can or education and will to work must go for nothing there shall be no lack of industry on my part i will work for you i will indeed papa willingly happily when your work can give me such a home as cottonois a home that one word of yours would secure for me i will thank you if you will only wait papa if you will only have the patience patience wait do you know what you are talking about do you pray to patience and waiting and hope in the future to a man who has no future to a man whose days are numbered and who feels the creeping chills of death stealing over him every day as he sits beside his wretched hearth or labours through his daily drudgery i can live as i have always lived yes but do you know or care to know that with every day life becomes more difficult for me your fine friends at bayswater have done with me i have spent the last sixpence i shall ever see from philip sheldon hawkehurst has cut me like the ungrateful hound he is when they have squeezed the orange they throw away the rind didn't voltaire say that when frederick of prussia gave him the go-by heaven knows it's true enough and now you who by a word might secure yourself a splendid position yes i say splendid for a poor drudge and dependent like you and ensure a home for me you forsooth must needs favour me with your high-flown sentiments about your sense of right and promise me a home in the future if i will wait and hope no diana waiting and hoping are done with for me and i can find a home in the bed of the river without your help you would not be so wicked as to do that cried diana aghast i don't know about the wickedness of the act but rely upon it when my choice lies between the workhouse and the river i shall prefer the river the modern workhouse is no inviting sanctuary and i dare say many a homeless wretch makes the same choice for some minutes there was silence diana stood with her elbows resting on the chimney-piece her face covered with her hands o oh lord teach me to do the thing which is right she prayed and in the next breath acted on the impulse of the moment what would you have me do she asked what any one but an idiot would do of her own accord accept the good fortune that has dropped into your lap do you think such luck as yours goes begging every day you would have me accept gustave lenoble's offer no matter what falsehoods may be involved in my acceptance of it i can see no reason for falsehood any one but an idiot would honour such a man any one but an idiot would thank providence for such good fortune very well papa exclaimed diana with a laugh that had no mirthful music i will not be the exceptional idiot if m lenoble does me the honour to repeat his offer and i think from his manner he means to do so i will accept it he shall repeat it cried the captain throwing off his assumption of the tragic father the oedipus colonius the leer the venerable victim of winter winds and men's ingratitude was transformed in a moment into an elderly jeremy diddler lined with lord foppington he shall repeat it i will have him at your feet to-morrow yes die my love i pledge myself to bring that about without compromise to your maidenly pride or the dignity of a paget my dear child i ought to have known that reflection would show you where your duty lies i fear i have been somewhat harsh but you must forgive me die i have set my heart on this match for your happiness as well as my own i could not stand the disappointment though i admired and still admire the high feeling and all that kind of thing which prompted your refusal a schoolgirlish sentimentality child 
but with something noble in it not the sentimentality of a vulgar schoolgirl the blue blood will show itself my love and now no no don't cry you will live to thank me for tonight's work yes my child to thank me when you look round your comfortable home by and by when my poor old bones are mouldering in their unpretending sepulchre and say to yourself i have my father to thank for this adverse circumstances forbade his doing his duty as happier fathers are allowed the privilege of doing theirs but it was his forethought his ever watchful care which secured me an admirable husband and a happy home mark my words the time will come when you will say this my dear i will try to think of you always kindly papa miss paget answered in a low sad voice and if my marriage can secure your happiness and gustave lenoble's i am content i only fear to take too much and give too little my love you must certainly be the lineal descendant of don quixote too much and too little forsooth let lenoble find a handsomer woman or a more elegant woman by gad elsewhere such a woman as a duke might be proud to make a duchess by jove there shall be no sense of obligation on our side my love gustave lenoble shall be made to feel that he gets change for his shilling kiss me child and tell me you forgive me for being a little rough with you just now forgive you yes papa i dare say you are wiser than i why should i refuse monsieur lenoble he is good and kind and will give us a happy home what more can i want do i want to be like charlotte to whom life seems all poetry and brightness and who is going to throw herself away on a penny a liner by jove interjected the captain can i hope to be like that girl with her happy ignorance of life her boundless love and trust oh no no papa those things are not for me she laid her head upon her father's breast and sobbed like a child this was her second farewell to the man she had loved the dreams she had dreamed the captain comforted her with a paternal embrace but was as powerless to comprehend her emotion as if he had found himself suddenly called upon to console the sorrows of a japanese widow hysterical he murmured these noble natures are subject to that kind of thing and now my love he continued in a more business-like tone let us talk seriously i think it would be very advisable for you to leave bayswater and take up your abode in these humble lodgings with me immediately why papa the reason is sufficiently obvious my love it is not right that you should continue to eat the bread of dependence as the future wife of gustave lenoble and in this case the word future means immediately papa cried diana suddenly you will not hurry me into this marriage i have consented for your sake you will not be so ungenerous as to as to hurry you no my dear of course not there should be no indecent haste your wishes your delicate and disinterested motives shall be consulted before all things yes my love cried the captain sorely afraid of some wavering on the part of his daughter and painfully anxious to conciliate her all shall be in accordance with your wishes but i must urge your immediate removal from bayswater first because m lenoble will naturally wish to see you oftener than he can while you are residing with people whose acquaintance i do not want him to make and secondly because you have no further need of mrs sheldon's patronage it has been kindness affection papa never patronage i could not leave mrs sheldon or charlotte abruptly or ungraciously upon any consideration they gave me a home when i most bitterly needed one they took me away from the dull round of schoolroom drudgery that was fast changing me into a hard hopeless joyless automaton my first duty is to them the captain's angry sniff alone expressed the indignation which this impious remark inspired my next shall be to you and m lenoble let me give mrs sheldon due notice of the change in our plans what do you call due notice asked horatio peevishly a quarter's notice oh indeed then for three months you are to dance attendance upon mrs sheldon while m lenoble is waiting to make you his wife i must consult the wishes of my friends papa very well my dear 
replied the captain with a sigh that was next of kin to a groan you must please yourself and your friends i suppose your poor old father is a secondary consideration and then timiously mindful of the skirmish he had just had with his daughter captain paget made haste to assure her of his regard and submission all shall be as you please my love he murmured there go to my room and smooth your hair and bathe your eyes while i ring for the tea diana obeyed she found eau de cologne and the most delicate of turkey sponges on her father's wash-hand stand jockey club and ivory-backed brushes somewhat yellow with age but bearing crest and monogram on his dressing-table the workhouse did not seem quite so near at hand as the captain had implied but with these sanguine people it is but a step from disappointment to despair what am i to tell mrs sheldon papa she asked when she was pouring out her father's tea well i think you had better say nothing except that my circumstances have somewhat improved and that my failing health requires your care i hate secrets papa so do i my dear but half confidences are more disagreeable than secrets diana submitted she secretly reserved to herself the right to tell charlotte anything she pleased from that dear adopted sister she would hide nothing if m lenoble should repeat his offer and i should accept it i will tell her all she thought it will make that dear girl happy to know that there is some one who loves me beside herself and then she thought of the strange difference of fate that gave to this charlotte halliday with her rich stepfather and comfortable surroundings a penniless soldier of fortune for a lover while to her the spendthrift adventurer's daughter came a wealthy suitor will hers be the dinner of herbs and mine the stalled ox she thought ah heaven forbid why is it so difficult to love wisely so easy to love too well she remembered the cynical french proverb when we cannot have what we love we must love what we have but the cynical proverb brought her no comfort she went back to bayswater with a strange bewildered feeling and having promised her father to go to omega street whenever he sent for her there was no actual pain in her mind no passionate desire to recall her promise no dread horror of the step to which she had pledged herself the feeling that oppressed her was the sense that such a step should have been the spontaneous election of her grateful heart proud of a good man's preference instead of a weak submission to a father's helplessness End of chapter four book the fifth chapter one of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by celine major charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braden chapter one taken by storm two days after her interview with gustave lenoble miss paget received a brief note from her father summoning her again to omega street he has not gone back to normandy wrote the captain my child he positively worships the ground you walk upon ah my love it is something to have a father i need scarcely tell you that his first idea of your excellence was inspired by those glowing descriptions of your goodness your beauty your heroism which i favoured him with en passant during our conversations at cotenoir where the happy accident of a business transaction first introduced me to him the interests of my only child have ever been near and dear to me and where a duller man would have perceived only a wealthy stranger my paternal instincts recognized at a glance the predestined husband of my daughter it needed my wide experience of life and as i venture to believe my subtle knowledge of the human heart to understand that a man who had lived for five-and-thirty years buried alive in a french province a charming place my love and for your refined taste replete with interest never seeing a mortal except his immediate neighbours would be the man of men to fall in love with the first attractive young woman he met among strangers 
come to me this afternoon without fail and come early yours h n c p diana obeyed this summons submissively but still troubled by that strange sense of bewilderment which had affected her since her stormy interview with captain paget she was not quite certain of herself the old dreams the sweet foolish girlish fancies were not yet put away altogether from her mind but she knew that they were foolish and she was half inclined to believe that there had been some wisdom in her father's scorn what do i want more she asked herself he is good and brave and true and he loves me if i were a princess my marriage would be negotiated for me by other people and i should have reason to consider myself very happy if the man whom the state selected for my husband should prove as good a man as gustave lenoble and he loves me me who have never before had power over a man's heart she walked across hyde park on this occasion as on the last and her thoughts though always confused mere rags and scraps of thought were not all unpleasant there was a smile half shy half tender on her face as she went into the little sitting-room where gustave was waiting for her she had seen his hat and overcoat in the passage and knew that he was there waiting for her to this poor desolate soul there was something sweet in the idea of being waited for as she stood but a little within the doorway blushing almost trembling with the sense of her changed position her lover came across the room and took her in his arms the strong brave arms held her to his breast and in that one embrace he took her to his heart and made her his own for ever in every story of lifelong affection there is one moment in which the bond is sealed diana looked up at the frank tender face and felt that she had found her conqueror master friend protector husband adoring and devoted lover gallant and fearless champion he was all and she divined his power and his worth as she glanced shyly upward ashamed to be so lightly won monsieur lenoble she faltered trying to withdraw herself from the strong encircling arm that held her as if by right gustave now and for ever my diane there shall be no more monsieur lenoble and in a few weeks it shall be my husband your father has given me to you he tells me to laugh at your refusals your scruples to assail you like your shakespeare's petruchio assails his catherine with audacious insolence that will not be denied and i shall take his advice look up into my face dear angel and defy me to take his advice happily the dear angel looked only downwards but m lenoble was resolved to have an agreeable response see then thou canst not defy me he cried in the only language he spoke and the tu for the first time sounded very tender very sweet thou canst not tell me thou art angry with me and the other the imbecile he is gone for ever is he not ah say yes yes he is gone said diana almost in a whisper is he quite gone the door of thine heart locked against him his luggage thrown out of the window he is gone she murmured softly he could not hold his place against you you are so strong so brave and he was only a shadow yes he is gone she said this with a little sigh of relief it was in all sincerity that she answered her suitor's question she felt that a crisis had come in her life the first page of a new volume and the old sad tear blotted book might be cast away dear angel wilt thou ever learn to love me asked gustave in a half whisper bending down his bearded face till his lips almost touched her cheek it is impossible not to love you she answered softly and indeed it seemed to her as if this chivalrous gaul was a creature to command the love of women the fear of men an achilles en frac a bayard without his coat of mail don quixote in his youth generous brave compassionate tender and with a brain not as yet distempered by the reading of silly romances captain paget emerged from his den as the little love scene ended he affected a gentlemanly unconsciousness of the poetry involved in the situation was pleasantly anxious about the tea-tray the candles and minor details of life and thus afforded the lovers ample time in which to recover their composure the frenchman was in no wise discomposed he was only abnormally gay 
with a little air of triumph that was not unpleasing diana was pale but there was an unwonted light in her eyes and she had by no means the appearance of a victim newly offered on a sacrificial altar of filial duty in sober truth miss paget was happier to-night than she had been for a long time at three-and-twenty she was girl enough to rejoice in the knowledge that she was truly loved and woman enough to value the sense of peace involved in the security of a prosperous future if she was grateful to her lover and the affection he had inspired in her heart had grown out of gratitude it was no mercenary consideration as to his income or position that made her grateful she thanked him for his love that treasure which she had never expected to possess she thanked him because he had taken her by the hand and led her out of the ranks of lonely dependent womanhood and seated her upon a throne on the steps whereof he was content to kneel whether the throne were a russian chair in some rustic cottage or a gilded fauteuil in a palace she cared very little it was the subject's devotion that was new and sweet to her she went to charlotte's room that night when mr sheldon's small household was at rest as she had gone on christmas eve to renounce her lover and to bless her rival this time it was a new confession she went to make and a confession that involved some shame there is nothing so hard to confess as inconsistency and every woman is not so philosophic as rachel varnagan who declared that to be constant was not always to love the same person but always to love some one miss paget seated herself at charlotte's feet as she had done on that previous occasion the weather was still cold enough to make a fire very pleasant though it was more than two months since the christmas bells had rung out upon the frosty air diana sat on a low hassock playing with the tassels of her friend's dressing-gown anxious to make her confession and solely at a loss for words in which to shape so humiliating an avowal charlotte she began abruptly at last have you any idea when you and valentine are to be married miss halliday gave a little cry of surprise why of course not di how can you ask such a question our marriage is what uncle george calls a remote contingency we are not to be married for ages not until valentine has obtained a secure position in literature and an income that seems almost impossible that was a special condition upon which mr sheldon papa gave his consent to our engagement of course it was very proper and prudent of him to think of these things and as he has been very kind and liberal-minded in his conduct to me throughout i should be a most ungrateful person if i refused to be guided by his advice and i suppose that means that your engagement is to be a long one the longest of long engagements and what can be happier than a long engagement one gets to know and understand the man one is to marry so thoroughly i think i know every turn of thought in valentine's mind every taste every fancy and i feel myself every day growing to think more and more like him i read the books he reads so as to be able to talk to him you know but i am not so clever as you di and valentine's favourite authors do sometimes seem rather dry to me but i struggle on you know and the harder i find the struggle the more i admire my dear love's cleverness think of him di three different articles in three different magazines last month the paper on apollodorus in the cheapside you know and that story in the charing cross how i lost my gingham umbrella and gained the acquaintance of mr gosselton so funny and the exhaustive treatise on the sources of light in the scientific saturday and think of the fuss they make about homer a blind old person who wrote a long rigmarole of a poem about battles and wrote it so badly that to this day no one knows whether it's one complete poem or a lot of odds and ends in the way of poetry put together by a man with an unpronounceable greek name when i think of what valentine accomplishes in comparison to homer and the little notice the reviewers take of him except to make him low-spirited by telling him that he is shallow and frivolous i begin to think that literature must be going to the dogs and here charlotte became meditative absorbed in the contemplation of mr hawkehurst's genius diana had begun the conversation very artfully intending to proceed by a gentle transition from charlotte's love affairs to her own 
but the conversation was drifting away from the subject into a discussion upon literature and the brilliant young essayist whose first adventurous flights seemed grand as the soaring of theban angle to this tender and admiring watcher of his skyward progress lotta said miss paget after a pause should you be very sorry if i were to leave you before your marriage leave me before my marriage diana is it not arranged that you are to live with mamma and be a daughter to her when i am gone and you will come and stay with valentine and me at our cottage and you will advise me about my housekeeping and teach me how to be a sensible useful economical wife as well as a devoted one leave us di what have i done or mamma or mr sheldon or anybody that you should talk of anything so dreadful what have you done dear girl dear friend dear sister everything to win my undying love and gratitude you have changed me from a hard disappointed bitter-minded woman envious at times even of you into your loving and devoted friend you have changed me from a miserable creature into a contented and hopeful one you have taught me to forget that my childhood and youth were one long night of wretchedness and degradation you have taught me to forgive the father who suffered my life to be what it was and made no one poor effort to lift me out of the slough of despond to which he had sunk i can say no more charlotte there are things that cannot be told by words and you want to leave me said charlotte in accents half wondering half reproachful my father wants me to leave you lotta and some one else some one whom you must know and like before i can be sure i like him myself him cried charlotte with a faint shriek of surprise diana what are you going to tell me a secret lotta something which my father has forbidden me to tell any one but which i will not hide from you my poor father has found a kind friend a friend who is almost as good to him as you are to me how merciful heaven is in raising up friends for outcasts and i have seen a good deal of this gentleman who is so kind to papa and the result is that chiefly for papa's sake and because i know that he is generous and brave and true i mean papa's friend m lenoble i have consented to be his wife diana cried charlotte with a sternness of manner that was alarming in so gentle a creature it shall never be what dear the sacrifice no dear no i understand it all for your cruel mercenary heartless designing father's sake you are going to marry a man whom you can't love you are going to offer up your poor bruised desolate heart on the altar of duty ah dear you can't think i forget what you told me only two short months ago though i seem selfish and frivolous and am always talking about him and parading my happiness as it must seem to you reckless of the wounds so newly healed in your noble unselfish heart but i do not altogether forget diana and such a sacrifice as this i will not allow i know you have resigned him to me i know you have thrust him from your heart as you told me that night but the hollow aching void that is left in your lonely heart shall be sacred di no stranger's image shall pollute it you shall not sacrifice your own peace to your father's selfishness no dear no with mamma and me you will always have a home you need stoop to no cruel barter such as this marriage and hereupon miss halliday wept over and caressed her friend as the confidant of agamemnon's daughter may have wept over and caressed that devoted young princess after the divination of calchas had become common talk in the royal household but if i think it my duty to accept m lenoble's offer lotta urged miss paget with some embarrassment of manner m lenoble is as rich as he is generous and my marriage with him will secure a happy home for my father the foolish dreams i told you about on christmas eve had faded from my mind before i dared to speak of them i could only confess my folly when i knew that i was learning to be wise pray do not think i am sordid or mercenary it is not because m lenoble is rich that i am inclined to marry him it is because because you want to throw yourself away for the advantage of your selfish heartless father interjected charlotte he has neglected you all your life and now wants to profit by the sacrifice of your happiness be firm di darling your charlotte will stand by you and find a home for you always come what may who is this m lenoble 
some horrible ugly old creature i dare say miss paget smiled and blushed the vision of gustave's frank handsome face arose before her very vividly as charlotte said this no dear she replied monsieur lenoble is not an old man five-and-thirty at most five-and-thirty repeated charlotte with a wry face you don't call that young and what is he like well dear i think he is the sort of man whom most people would call handsome i'm sure you would like him lotta he is so candid so animated so full of strength and courage the sort of man to whom one would naturally look in any emergency or danger the sort of man in whose company fear would be impossible diana cried charlotte suddenly you are in love with him lotta yes dear you are in love with him repeated miss halliday embracing her friend with effusion yes over head and ears in love with him and you are ashamed to confess the truth to me and you are half ashamed to confess it even to yourself as if you could deceive an old stager like me cried charlotte laughing why you dear inconstant thing while i have felt myself the guiltiest and most selfish creature in the world for robbing you of valentine you have been quietly transferring your affections to this monsieur gustave lenoble who is very rich and brave and true and generous and what most people would call handsome bless you a thousand times my darling you have made me so happy indeed lotta yes dear the thought that there was a blank in your life made a dark cloud in mine i know i have been very selfish very thoughtless but i could never have been quite free from a sense of self-reproach but now there is nothing for me but happiness oh darling i so long to see your monsieur lenoble you shall see him dear and in the meantime tell me what he is like miss halliday insisted upon a full true and particular account of m lenoble's personal appearance diana gave it but not without some sense of embarrassment she could not bring herself to be enthusiastic about gustave lenoble though in her heart there was a warmth of feeling that surprised her what a hypocrite you are di exclaimed charlotte presently i know you love this good frenchman almost as dearly as i love valentine and that the thought of his affection makes you happy and yet you speak of him in little measured sentences and you won't be enthusiastic even about his good looks it is difficult to pass from dreams to realities lotta i have lived so long among dreams that the waking world seems strange to me that is only a poetical way of saying that you are ashamed of having changed your mind i will tell m lenoble what a lukewarm creature you are and how unworthy of his love you shall tell him what you please but remember dear my engagement must not be spoken about yet a while not even to your mamma papa makes a strong point of this and i have promised to obey though i am quite in the dark as to his reasons miss halliday submitted to anything her friend wished only entreating that she might be introduced to m lenoble diana promised her this privilege but it speedily transpired that diana's promise was not at all that was wanted on this occasion for some time past in fact from the very commencement of charlotte's engagement mr sheldon had shown himself punctilious to an exceeding degree with regard to his stepdaughter the places to which she went and the people with whom she consorted appeared to be matters of supreme importance in his mind when speaking of these things he gave those about him to understand that his ideas had been the same from the time of charlotte's leaving school but diana knew that this was not true mr sheldon's theories had been much less strict and mr sheldon's practice had been much more careless prior to miss halliday's engagement no stately principal of a school for young ladies could have been more particular as to the movements of her charges more apprehensive of wolf and sheep's clothing in the shape of singing or drawing-master than mr sheldon seemed to be in these latter days even those pleasant walks in kensington gardens which had been one of the regular occupations of the days were now forbidden mr sheldon did not like that his daughter should walk in public with no better protector than diana paget there is something disreputable in two girls marching about those gardens together according to my ideas said this ultra-refined stockbroker one morning at the family breakfast-table 
i don't like to see my stepdaughter do anything i should forbid my own daughter to do and if i had a daughter i should most decidedly forbid all lonely rambles in kensington gardens you see lotta two girls as attractive as you and miss paget can't be too particular where you go and what you do when you want air and exercise you can get both in the garden and when you want change of scene and a peep at the fashions you can drive out with mrs sheldon to this deprivation charlotte submitted somewhat unwillingly but with no sign of open rebellion she thought her stepfather foolish and unreasonable but she always bore in mind the fact that he had been kind and disinterested in the matter of her engagement and she was content to prove her gratitude by any little sacrifice of this kind was not her lover permitted to spend his sundays in her society and to call on her at his discretion during the week and what were walks in kensington gardens compared with the delight of his dear presence it is true that she had sometimes been favoured with mr hawkehurst's society in the course of her airing but she knew that he sacrificed his hours of work or study for the chance of half an hour in her society and she felt that there might be gain to him in her loss of liberty she told him when next they met that the morning walks were forbidden and so jealous a passion is love that mr hawkehurst was nowise sorry to find that his pearl was strictly watched and carefully guarded well it seems very particular of mr sheldon of course he said but upon my word i think he's right such a girl as you oughtn't to go about with no better protection than diana can give you fellows will stare so at a pretty girl you know and i can't bear to think my pearl should be stared at by impertinent strangers mr hawkehurst did not however find the strict notions of his lady-love's stepfather quite so agreeable when he wanted to take his pearl to the winter exhibitions of pictures he was told that miss halliday could go nowhere except accompanied by her mamma and as georgie did not care about pictures and found herself unequal to the fatigue of attending the winter exhibitions he was obliged to forego the delight of seeing them with lotta on his arm he pronounced mr sheldon on this occasion to be a narrow-minded idiot but withdrew the remark in a contrite spirit when charlotte reminded him of that gentleman's generosity yes dear he has certainly been very kind and very disinterested more disinterested than even you think but somehow i can't make him out it was very well for miss halliday that she had submitted to this novel restriction with as good a grace inasmuch as mr sheldon had prepared himself for active opposition he had given orders to his wife and further orders to mrs woolper to the effect that his stepdaughter should not be permitted to go out of doors except in his own or her mother's company she is a very good girl you see nancy he said to the old housekeeper but she's young and she's giddy and of course i can't take upon myself to answer for miss paget who may or may not be a good girl she comes of a very bad stock however and i am bound to remember that some people think that you can't give a girl too much liberty my ideas lean the other way i think you can't take too much care of a pretty girl whom you are bound by duty to protect all this sounded very noble and very conscientious it sounded thus even to mrs woolper who in her intercourse with philip sheldon could never quite divest herself of one appalling memory that memory was the death of tom halliday and the horrible thoughts and fears that had for a time possessed her mind in relation to that death the shadow of that old ghastly terror sometimes came between her and mr sheldon even now though she had long ago assured herself that the terror had been alike groundless and unreasonable didn't i see my own nephew carried off by a fever twice as sudden as the fever that carried off poor mr halliday she said to herself and am i to think horrid things of him as i nursed a baby because a cup of greasy beef tea turned my stomach convinced by such reasoning as this that she had done her master a grievous wrong and grateful for the timely shelter afforded her in her old age mrs woolper felt that she could not do too much in her benefactor's service she had already shown herself a clever managing housekeeper had reformed abuses and introduced a new system of care and economy below stairs to the utter bewilderment of poor georgie for whom the responsibilities of the gothic villa had been an overwhelming burden georgie was not particularly grateful to the energetic old yorkshirewoman who had taken this burden off her hands but she was submissive i never felt myself much in the house my dear she said to lotta 
but i am sure since ann woolper has been here i have felt myself a cipher mrs woolper naturally sharp and observant was not slow to perceive that mr sheldon was abnormally anxious about his stepdaughter she ascribed this anxiety to a suspicious nature an inherent distrust of other people in the part of her master and in some measure to his ignorance of womankind he seems to think that she'd run away and get married on the sly at a word from that young man but he doesn't know what a dear innocent soul she is and how sorry she'd be to displease any one that's kind to her i don't know anything about miss paget she's more standoffish than our own miss though she is little better than a genteel kind of servant but she seems fair-spoken enough as to our miss bless her dear heart she wants no watching i'll lay but i dare say those city folks with their stocks going up and going down and always bringing about the ruin of somebody or other go which way they will get their poor heads so muddled with figures that they can't believe there's such a thing as honesty in the world this was the gist of mrs woolper's evening musing in the snug little housekeeper's room at the lawn it was a very comfortable little room and held sacred to mrs woolper the three young females and the boy in buttons who formed mr sheldon's indoor establishment preferring the license of the kitchen to the strict etiquette of the housekeeper's room the apartment as well as every other room in the stockbroker's house bore the stamp of prosperity a comfortable easy-chair reposed the limbs of mrs woolper a bright little fire burned in a bright little grate and its ruddy light was reflected in a bright little fender prints of the goody class adorned the walls and a small round table with a somewhat gaudy cover supported mrs woolper's work-box and family bible both of which she made it a point of honour to carry about with her and to keep religiously through good fortune and through evil fortune neither of which however afforded her much employment she felt herself to be much nearer grace with the family bible by her side than she would have been without it she felt indeed that the maintenance and due exhibition of the family bible was in itself a kind of religion but that she should peruse its pages was not in the bond her eyes were old and weak sharp enough to discover the shortcomings of mr sheldon's young maid-servants but too feeble even for long primer End of chapter seventeen read by celine major book the fifth chapter two of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braddon firm as a book after that midnight interview between the two girls in miss halliday's bedroom life went very smoothly at the gothic villa for two or three days during which the impulsive charlotte being forbidden to talk openly of the change in her friend's position was fain to give vent to her feelings by furtive embraces and hand squeezings sly nods and meaning becks and mischievous twinkling of her arch grey eyes she talked to valentine more than ever now feeling herself at liberty to sing what paeans she pleased in praise of her hero now that her friend had also a fitting subject for paeans and now it's your turn to talk of monsieur lenoble dear she would say naively when she had entertained diana with the minute details of her last conversation with her lover or a lively sketch of the delights of that ideal cottage which she loved to furnish and unfurnish in accordance with the new fancy of the hour diana was pleased to listen to her girlish talk to hang and rehang the ideal draperies to fill and refill the ideal bookcase to plan and replan the arrangements of that ideal existence which was to be all joy and love and harmony but when her turn came and she was asked to be rapturous about her own lover she could say nothing that which she felt was too deep for words the thought of her lover was strange to her the fact of his love was mysterious and wonderful 
she could not talk of him with the customary frivolous schoolgirl talk and love for him had so newly taken root in her heart that there were as yet no blossoms to be gathered from that magical plant don't ask me to talk of him lotta dear she said i am not yet sure that i love him i only feel that it is sweet to be loved by him i think providence must have sent him to me in pity for my desolation this was almost the same fancy that had occurred to susan meynell five-and-thirty years before this time when gustave the first had rescued her from the suicide's unrepentable sin that chivalrous turn of mind which was hereditary in the race of lenoble predisposed these men to pity loneliness and beauty weakness and sorrow this pity for helplessness may have been indeed only an element of their exceeding strength was not the rescue of weaklings and women an unfailing attribute in the mighty men of old who so prompt as hercules to fly to the rescue of hesione who so swift as perseus to save andromeda and what sea monster more terrible than loneliness and poverty in a few days there came another letter from captain paget containing a fresh summons to omega street lenoble positively returns to normandy to-morrow he wrote to see his girls and no doubt break the news of his approaching marriage he much wants to see you and as i have forbidden his calling on you at the lawn can only meet you here he is to drink tea with me at the usual time to-morrow evening and i shall expect to see you early in the afternoon this afforded an opportunity for that introduction to which miss halliday looked forward with so much interest if mr sheldon and your mamma will let you come with me this afternoon dear i shall be very pleased to take you said diana and she felt that she would appear less in the character of a lamb led to the slaughter if she could go to meet her betrothed accompanied by charlotte but in this matter both the young ladies were doomed to disappointment mr sheldon showed himself a social draco in all things relating to his stepdaughter being forbidden to reveal the existence of gustave lenoble charlotte could only urge a frivolous desire to accompany her friend in a pilgrimage dictated by filial duty to the practical mind of philip sheldon this desire appeared altogether absurd and unreasonable and he did not hesitate to express himself to that effect in a tete-a-tete -tete with his stepdaughter what good on earth can you do by going to see a gouty old man who has his own daughter to dance attendance upon him asked mr sheldon really charlotte i am surprised to hear such a proposition from a girl of your good sense miss paget is your companion not your visitor it is her duty to indulge your whims but it is not your place to give way to hers but this is a whim of mine papa i should really like to spend the afternoon at chelsea it would be a change you know mr sheldon looked at his stepdaughter with a sharp and searching gaze a gaze in which there was suspicion as well as curiosity it is a very discreditable whim for a young lady in your position he said sternly and i beg that such a proposition may not be made to me again this was decisive charlotte submitted and diana went alone to omega street she found gustave waiting for her he proposed a walk and captain paget was enthusiastic upon the subject of fresh air and the benefits arising therefrom so the lovers went out in the bleak winter afternoon and wandered in the dreary pimlico region as far as st james's park gustave delighted to have diana's hand upon his arm and diana almost bewildered by a sense of happiness which seemed unreal by reason of its very novelty gustave was all enthusiasm full of plans for the future he would have had the marriage take place immediately if such a thing had been possible but diana showed him that it would not be possible her first duty was to the only friends she had ever known gustave argued the point resolutely for nearly an hour during which time they made their way to the very gates of st james's park but diana was more resolute still what a tyrannical wife i shall have by and by said gustave i think you care for these sheldons more than for me diane 
these sheldons have been so good to me in the past and i mean to be so good to you in the future answered gustave you shall be the happiest wife in normandy if a foolish doting husband's devotion can make you happy what have i done to deserve so much devotion diana murmured wonderingly what have you done nothing less than nothing you will not even run the hazard of offending your family of sheldon in order to make me happy but fate has said at the feet of that girl with the dark eyes and pale proud face shall poor lenoble of cote noire put down his heart do you know what i said to myself when i saw you first in the little parlour yonder ah no how should you guess she is there said i behold her it is thy destiny lenoble on which thou gazest and thou love wert calm and voiceless as fate quiet as the goddess of marble before which the pagans offered their sacrifices across whose cold knees they laid their rich garments i put my treasures in your lap my love my heart my hopes all the treasures i had to offer this was all very sweet but there was a sting even mingled with that sweetness diana told herself that love like this should only be offered on the purest shrine and when she remembered the many stains upon her father's honour it seemed to her that a part of the shame must needs cleave to her gustave she said presently after an absent meditative mood from which her lover had vainly tried to beguile her does it not seem to you that there is something foolish in this talk of love and confidence between you and me and that all your promises have been a little too lightly made what do you know of me you see me sitting in my father's room and because my eyes happen to please you or for some reason as foolish as that you ask me to be your wife i might have been one of the worst of women you might have been yes dear but you are not and if you had been gustave lenoble would not have flung his heart into your lap even if your eyes had been sweeter than they are we impulsive people are people of quick perceptions and know what we are doing better than our reflective friends imagine i did not need to be an hour in your company dear love in order to know that you are noble and true there are tones in the voice there are expressions of the face that tell these things better than words can tell them for you see words can lie while tones and looks are apt to be true yes my angel i knew you from that first night my heart leaped across all conventional barriers and found its way straight to yours i can see that you think much better of me than i deserve but even supposing you not to be deceived as to myself i fear you are much deceived as to my surroundings i know that your father is poor and that the burden of his poverty weighs heavily on you that is enough for me to know no monsieur lenoble it is not enough for you to know if i am to be your wife i will not enter your family as an impostor i told you the truth about myself the other day when you questioned me and i am bound to tell you the truth about my father and then she told him in the plainest frankest language the story of her father's life she inflicted no unnecessary shame on captain paget she made no complaint of her neglected childhood and joyless youth but she told gustave that her father had been an adventurer keeping doubtful company and earning his bread by doubtful means i hope and believe that if a peaceful home could be secured for his declining years he would live the rest of his life like a gentleman and a christian and that the bitter struggle for existence being ended he would be sorry for the past i doubt if the sense of shame ever deserted him when he was living that wretched wandering life leaving debts and difficulties behind him everywhere always harassed and hunted by creditors who had good cause to be angry yes gustave i do believe that if it should please providence to give my father a peaceful home at last he will be thankful for god's mercy and will repent the sins of life and now i have told you the kind of heritage i can bring my husband my dear love i will accept the heritage for the sake of her who brings it i never meant to be less than a son to your father and if he is not the best of fathers as regards the past we will try to make him a decent kind of father as regards the future i have long understood that captain paget is something ever so little of an adventurer 
it was the pursuit of fortune that brought him to me and without knowing it he brought me my fortune in the shape of his daughter diana blushed as she remembered that captain paget had not been so innocent of any design in this matter as the frenchman imagined and you will receive even papa for my sake asked diana with all my heart ah you are indeed a generous lover a lover who is not generous is bah there is nothing in creation so mean as the wretch whom love does not render generous when one sees the woman whom fate intends for one's wife is one to stop to inquire the character of her father her mother her sister her cousin for there is no stopping when you begin that a man who loves makes no inquiries if he finds his jewel in the gutter he picks it out of the mud and carries it away in his bosom too proud of his treasure to remember where he found it always provided that the jewel is no counterfeit but the real gem fit for a king's crown and my diamond is of the purest water by and by we will try to drain the gutter that is to say we will try to pay those small debts of which you speak to lodging housekeepers and tradesmen who have trusted your father you would pay papa's debts cried diana in amazement but why not all these little debts the thought of which is so bitter to you might be discharged for two or three thousand pounds your father tells me i am to be very rich by and by my father tells you ah then you have allowed him to involve you in some kind of speculation he has involved me in no speculation and in no risk that two or three hundred pounds will not cover the whole business seems very mysterious gustave perhaps it has to do with a secret which i am pledged to keep i will not allow your father to lead me into any quagmire of speculation believe me dear one after this they went back to omega street in the winter gloaming and diana loved and admired this man with all her heart and mind a new life lay before her very bright and fair there where had been only the barren desert was now a fair landscape shining in the sunlight of hope do you think your children will ever love me gustave she asked not without some sense of wonder that this impulsive light-hearted lover should be the owner of children she fancied that a responsibility so grave as paternity must needs have impressed some stamp of solemnity upon the man who bore it ever love thee cried gustave child they will adore thee they ask only some one to love their hearts are gardens of flowers and thou shalt gather the flowers but wilt thou be happy at cote noire thou it is somewhat sad perhaps the grave old chateau with the long sombre corridors but thou shalt choose new furniture new garnitures at rouen and we will make all bright and gay like the heart of thy affianced thou wilt not be dull dull with you and yours i shall thank god for my happy home day and night as i never thought to thank him a few months ago when i was dissatisfied wicked tired of my life and when you thought of that other one ah how he was an imbecile that other one but thou wilt never think of him again it is a dream that is past said m lenoble that self-confidence which was an attribute of his sanguine nature rendered the idea of a rival not altogether unpleasant to him he was gratified by the idea of his own victory and the base rival's annihilation diane i want to show thee the home that is to be thine he said presently your sheldon family must give thee at least a holiday if they refuse to let thee go altogether thou wilt come to normandy with thy father he is coming for a week or two now that his gout is better i want to show thee cote noire and beau bocage the place where my father was born it will seem dreary perhaps to thine english eyes but to me it is very dear nothing that is dear to you shall appear dreary to me said diana by this time they had arrived at omega street again miss paget made tea for her lover strange to say the operation seemed to grow more agreeable with every repetition 
while taking his tea from the hands of his beloved gustave pressed the question of diana's visit to normandy about her sheldon family she is adamant he said to captain paget who sipped his tea and smiled at the lovers with the air of an aristocratic patriarch there is to be no marriage till it pleases mrs sheldon to set her free i consent to this only as man must consent to the inevitable but i say to her can she not come to normandy for a fortnight say but one short fortnight to see her home she will come with you she has but to ask a holiday of her friends and it is done of course exclaimed the captain she shall come with me if necessary i myself will ask it of sheldon but it will be best not to mention where you are going diana there are reasons best known to our friend gustave and myself which render secrecy advisable just at present you can say rouen that is quite near enough to the mark to come within the limits of truth added horatio with the tone of a man who had never quite outstepped those limits yes rouen and you will come with me with us said gustave i will put off my journey for a day or two for the sake of going with you you have to meet fleurus in rouen haven't you yes he is to be there on the fifth of march and this is the last day of february i had a letter from him this morning all goes swimmingly diana wondered what it could be which went swimmingly but she was obliged to content herself with her lover's assurance that he had not allowed her father to involve him in any kind of speculation End of firm as a book book the fifth chapter three of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braddon against wind and tide between philip sheldon and his brother there was at this time a state of feeling somewhat akin to the relations between a subjugated country and its conqueror the vanquished is fain to accept whatever the victor is pleased to give though discontent and impotent rage may be gnawing his entrails george sheldon had been a loser in that game in which the haygarthian inheritance was the state he had held good cards and had played them with considerable cleverness but no play could prevail against his antagonist's ace of trumps the ace of trumps was charlotte halliday and as to his mode and matter of playing this card mr sheldon was for the present profoundly mysterious i have known a good many inscrutable cards in my time the solicitor of gray's inn observed to his elder brother in the course of fraternal converse but i think for inscrutability you put the topper on the lot what do you expect to get out of this haygarth estate come phil let us have your figures in plain english i am to have a fifth that's all signed and sealed but how about your share what agreement have you got from miss halliday none none what would the world think of me if i extorted money or the promise of money from my wife's daughter do you think i could enforce any deed between her and me ah i see you go in for respectability and you are going to leave the settlement of your claims to your stepdaughter's generosity you will let her marry hawkehurst with her hundred thousand pounds and then you will say to those two mr and mrs hawkehurst be so kind as to hand over my share of the plunder that is not like you phil perhaps you will be good enough to spare yourself the trouble of speculating about my motives go your way and leave me to go mine but this is a case in which i have an interest if charlotte marries hawkehurst i don't see how you are to profit to any extent that you would care about by the haygarth fortune but on the other hand if she should die unmarried without a will the money would go to your wife oh my god philip sheldon is that what you mean the question was so sudden the tone of horror in which it was spoken so undisguised that mr sheldon the stockbroker was for one moment thrown off his guard 
his breath thickened he tried to speak but his dry lips could shape no word it was only one moment that he faltered in the next he turned upon his brother angrily and asked what he meant you've been promised your reward he said leave me to look after mine you'll take those papers round to greenwood and greenwood they want to talk to you about them yes i'll take the papers greenwood and greenwood were mr sheldon's own solicitors a firm of some distinction on whose acumen and experience the stockbroker placed implicit reliance they were men of unblemished respectability and to them mr sheldon had confided the care of his stepdaughter's interests always reserving the chief power in his own hands these gentlemen thought well of the young lady's prospects and were handling the case in that slow and stately manner which marks the handling of such cases by eminent firms of the slow and stately class mr sheldon wished his brother good day and was about to depart when george planted himself suddenly before the door look you here phil he said with an intensity of manner that was by no means common to him i want to say a few words to you and i will say them there was an occasion ten years ago on which i ought to have spoken out and didn't i have never ceased to regret my cowardice yes by jove i hate myself for it and there are times when i feel as if my share in that wretched business was almost as bad as yours i don't know what you mean of course not that's your text and you'll stick to it but you do know what i mean and you shall know what i mean if plain words can tell you you and i had a friend phil he was a good friend to me and i liked him as much as a man of the world can afford to like anybody if i had been down in the world and had asked him for a hundred pounds to give me a new start in life i think he'd have said george here's a cheque for you that's my notion of a friend and yet i stood by that man's deathbed and saw him sinking and knew what ailed him and didn't stretch out my hand to save him be so good as to move away from that door said mr sheldon livid to the lips with smothered fury but able to put on a bold front nevertheless i didn't come here to listen to rhodomontade of this kind or to bandy words with you get out of my way not till i've said my say there shall be no rhodomontade this time i stood by and saw my best friend murdered by you i kept my counsel for your sake and when you had made your fortune by his death i asked you for a little money you know how much you gave me and how graciously you gave it if you had given me twenty times the sum you gained by tom halliday's death i would give it back and twenty times as much again to bring him back to life and to feel that i had never aided and abetted a murderer yes by god i would though i am not straight-laced or over-scrupulous at the best of times but that's past and all the money in the bank of england wouldn't undo what you did in fitzgeorge street but if you try on any such tricks with tom halliday's daughter if that's the scheme you've hatched for getting hold of this money as surely as we two live i'll let in the light upon your doings and save the girl whose father you murdered i will philip let come what may you can't get me out of the way when it suits you you see i know you that's the best antidote against your medicines if you'll be so good as to say these things on change i can bring an action for libel or get you put into a madhouse there's no good in saying them here philip sheldon even in this crisis was less agitated than his brother being of a harder nature and less subject to random impulses of good or evil he caught his accuser by the collar of his coat and flung him violently from the doorway thus ended his visit to gray's inn boldly as he had borne himself during the interview he went to his office profoundly depressed and dispirited so i am to have him against me he said to himself he can do me no real harm but he can harass and annoy me if he should drop any hint to hawkehurst 
but he'll scarcely do that perhaps i've ridden him a little too roughly in the past and yet if i'd been smoother where would his demands have ended no concession in these cases means ruin he shut himself in his office and sat down to his desk to confront his difficulties for a long time the bark which was freighted with philip sheldon's fortunes had been sailing in troubled waters he had been an unconscious disciple of lord bacon inasmuch as the boldness inculcated by that philosopher had been the distinguishing characteristic of his conduct in all the operations of life as a speculator his boldness had served him well adventures from which timid spirits shrunk appalled had brought golden harvests to this daring gamester when some rich argosy upon the commercial ocean fired her minute guns and sent up signals of distress menaced by the furious tempest lifted high on the crest of mountainous waves below which black and fathomless yawn the valleys of death a frail ark hovering above the ravening jaws of all devouring poseidon philip sheldon was among that chosen band of desperate wreckers who dared to face the storm and profit by the tempest and terror from such argosies while other men watched and waited for a gleam of sunlight on the dark horizon mr sheldon had obtained for himself goodly merchandise the debenture of railways that were in bad odour unitas bank shares immediately after the discovery of gigantic embezzlements by swillinger the unitas bank secretary the mole and borough railway stock when the mole and borough scheme was as yet in the clouds and the wiseacres prognosticated its failure the shares in foreign loans which the rothschilds were buying sub rosa these and such as these had employed mr sheldon's capital and from the skilful manipulation of capital thus employed mr sheldon had trebled the fortune secured by his alliance with tom halliday's widow it had been the stockbroker's fate to enter the money market at a time when fortunes were acquired with an abnormal facility he had made the most of his advantages and neglected none of his opportunities he had seized good fortune by the forelock and not waited to find the harridan's bald and slippery crown turned to him in pitiless derision he had made only one mistake and that he made in common with many of his fellow-players in the great game of speculation always going on eastward of temple bar he had mistaken the abnormal for the normal he had imagined that these splendid opportunities were the natural evolvements of an endless sequence of everyday events and when the sequence was abruptly broken and when last of the seven fat kind vanished off the transitory scene of life to make way for a dismal succession of lean kind there was no sanguine youngster newly admitted to the sacred privileges of the house more astounded by the change than mr sheldon the panic came like a thief in the night and it found mr sheldon a speculator for the rise the melampuses and amphariarses of the stock exchange had agreed in declaring that a man who bought into consoles at ninety must see his capital increased and what was true of this chief among securities was of course true of other securities the panic came and from ninety consoles declined dismally slowly hopelessly to eighty-five and a half securities less secure sank with a rapidity corresponding with their constitutional weakness as during the ravages of an epidemic the weaker are first to fall victims to the destroyer so while this fever raged on change the feeble enterprises the risky transactions sank at an appalling rate some to total expiry the man who holds a roaring lion by the tail could scarcely be worse off than the speculator in these troublous times to let go is immediate loss to hold on for a certain time might be redemption could one but know the exact moment in which it would be wise to let go but to hold on until the beast grows more and more furious and then to let go and be eaten up alive is what many men did in that awful crisis if philip sheldon had accepted his first loss and been warned by the first indication that marked the turning of the tide 
he would have been a considerable loser but he would not accept his loss and he would not be warned by that early indication he had implicit belief in his own cleverness and he fancied if every other bark in that tempest-tossed ocean foundered and sank his boat might ride triumphantly across the harbour bar secure by virtue of his science and daring as a navigator it was not till he had seen a small fortune melt away in the payment of contango that he consented to the inevitable the mistakes of one year devoured the fruits of nine years successful enterprise and the philip sheldon of this present year was no richer than the man who had stood by tom halliday's bedside and waited the advent of the equal foot that knows no difference between the threshold of kingly palace or a pauper refuge not only did he find himself as poor a man as in that hateful stage of his existence to remember which was a dull dead pain even to him but a man infinitely more heavily burdened he had made for himself a certain position and the fall from that must needs be a cruel and damaging fall the utter annihilation of all his chances in life the stockbroker's fitful slumbers at this time began to be haunted by the vision of a blackboard fixed against the wall of a public resort a blackboard on which appeared his own name in what strange places feverish dreams showed him this hideous square of painted deal now it was on the walls of the rooms he lived in now on the door of a church like luther's propositions now at a street corner where should have been the name of the street now inky black against the fair white headstone of his own grave miserable dream miserable man for whom the scraping together of sordid dross was life's only object and who in losing money lost all this agonizing consciousness of loss and of close impending disgrace was the wolf which this spartan stockbroker concealed beneath his waistcoat day after day while the dull common joyless course of his existence went on and his shallow wife smiled at him from the opposite side of his hearth more interested in a new stitch for her crochet or berlin wool work than by the inner life of her husband and charlotte and her lover contemplated existence from their own point of view and cherished their own dreams and their own hopes and were in all things as far away from the moody meditator as if they had been natives of upper india the ruin which impended over the unlucky speculator was not immediate but it was not far off the shadow of it already wrapped him in a twilight obscurity his repute as a clever and a safe man had left him he was described now as a daring man and the wiseacres shook their heads as they talked of him one of the next to go will be sheldon said the wiseacres but in these days of commercial epidemic there was no saying who would be the first to go it was the end of the world in little one was taken and another left the gazette overran its customary column like a swollen river and flooded a whole page of the times newspaper and men looked to the lists of names in the wednesday and saturday papers as to the trump of archangels sounding the destruction of the universe for some time the bark in which mr sheldon had breasted those turbulent waters had been made of paper this was nothing paper boats were the prevailing shipping in those waters but captain sheldon's bark needed refitting and the captain feared a scarcity of paper or worse still the awful edict issued from some commercial areopagus that for him there should be no more paper once before mr sheldon had found himself face to face with ruin complete and irredeemable when all common expedients had been exhausted and his embarrassments had become desperate he had found a desperate expedient and had extricated himself from those embarrassments the time had come in which a new means of extrication must be found as desperate as the last if need were as philip sheldon had faced the situation before he faced it now unshrinkingly though with a gloomy anger against destiny it was hard for him that such a thing should have to be repeated if he pitied anybody he pitied himself and this kind of compassion is very common with this kind of character do not the casket letters show us if we may trust them to show us anything that mary stuart was very sorry for herself when she found herself called upon to make an end of darnley 
in mr swinburne's wonderful study in morbid anatomy there are perhaps no finer touches than those which reveal the queen's selfish compassion for her own heartlessness end of book the fifth chapter three against winded tide book the fifth chapter four of charlotte's inheritance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org charlotte's inheritance by mary elizabeth braddon diana asks for a holiday diana informed mrs sheldon of her father's wish that she should leave bayswater before doing this she had obtained the captain's consent to the revelation of her engagement to be married i don't like to leave them in a mysterious manner papa she said i have told charlotte a good deal already under a promise of secrecy but i should like to tell mrs sheldon that there is a real reason for my leaving her very well my love since you are so amazingly squeam honourable interposed the captain remembering how much depended on his daughter's marriage and what a very difficult person he had found her yes my dear of course i respect your honourable feeling and er yes you may tell mrs sheldon and that of course includes mr sheldon since the lady is but an inoffensive cipher that you are about to be married to a french gentleman of position you will of course be obliged to mention his name and then will arise the question as to where and how you met him and upon my word it's confoundedly awkward that should it, you should insist on enlightening these people you see my dear girl what i want to avoid for the present is any chance of collision between the sheldons and lenoble papa exclaimed diana impatiently why must there be all this scheming oh very well miss paget tell them what you like cried the captain aggravated beyond endurance by such inherent perversity all i can say is that a young woman who quarrels with her bread and butter is likely to come to dry bread and very little of that perhaps i wash my hands of the business tell them what you like i will not tell them more than i feel to be actually necessary papa the young lady replied calmly i do not think mr sheldon will trouble himself about m lenoble he seems very much occupied by his own affairs hm sheldon seems harassed anxious does he well yes papa i have thought so for the last few months if i may venture to judge by the expression of his face as he sits at home in the evening reading the paper or staring at the fire i am sure he has many anxieties troubles even mrs sheldon and charlotte do not appear to notice these things they are accustomed to see him quiet and reserved and they don't perceive the change in him as i do oh there is a change is there yes a decided change why the deuce couldn't you tell me this before why should i tell you that mr sheldon seems anxious i should not have told you now if you had not appeared to dread his interference in our affairs i can't help observing these things but i don't want to play the part of a spy no you're so infernally punct so delicate-minded my love said the captain pulling himself up suddenly for the second time forgive me if i was impatient just now you look at these things from a higher point of view than that of a battered old man of the world like me but if you should see anything remarkable in mr sheldon's conduct on another occasion my love i should be obliged to you if you would be more communicative he and i have been allied in business you see and it is important for me to know these things i have not seen anything remarkable in mr sheldon's conduct papa i have only seen him thoughtful and dispirited and i suppose anxieties are common to every man of business georgie received miss paget's announcement with mingled lamentations and congratulations i am sure i am heartily glad for your sake diana she said but what we shall do without you i don't know who is to see to the drawing-room being dusted every morning when you are gone 
i'm sure i tremble for the glass shades don't imagine i'm not pleased to think you should settle in life advantageously my love i'm not so selfish as that though i will say that there never was a girl with more natural talent for making up pretty little caps than you the one i have on has been admired by everybody even Anne Woolper this morning when i was going into the butcher's book with her for i insist upon going into the butcher's book with her weekly whether she likes it or not though the way that man puts down the items is so bewildering that i feel myself a perfect baby in her hands even Anne admired it and said how young looking it is and then she brought up the time in fitzgeorge street and poor tom's illness and almost upset me for the rest of the day and now dear let me offer you my sincere congratulations of course you know that you would always have had a home with me but service or at least companionship is no inheritance as the proverb says and for your own sake i'm very glad to think that you are going to have a house of your own and now tell me what he is like monsieur what's his name mrs sheldon had been told but had not remembered the name her great anxiety as well as charlotte's was to know what manner of man the affianced lover was if diana's future happiness had been contingent on the shape of her husband's nose or the colour of his eyes these two ladies could not have been more anxious upon the subject has he long eyelashes and a dreamy look in his eyes like valentine asked charlotte secretly convinced that her lover had a copyright in these personal graces does he wear whiskers asked georgie i remember when i was quite a girl and went to parties at barlingford being struck by mr sheldon's whiskers and i was quite offended with papa who was always making sarcastic remarks for calling them mutton-chop whiskers but they really were the shape of mutton cutlets at that time he wears them differently now mrs sheldon branched off into a disquisition on whiskers and diana escaped from the task of describing her lover she could not have described him to georgie by and by she asked permission to leave bayswater for a fortnight in order to see her lover's home and friends i will come back to you and stay as long as you like dear mrs sheldon she said and make you as many caps as you please and i will make them for you by and by when i am living abroad and send them over to you in a bandbox it will be a great delight to me to be of some little service to a friend who has been so kind and perhaps you will fancy the caps are prettier when they can boast of being french you darling generous-minded girl and you won't go away for a fortnight and never come back again will you dear i had a cook who did that and left me with a large dinner-party hanging over my head and how i got through it with a strange man cook who charged a guinea and used fresh butter at twenty pence a pound as if it had been dirt and two strange men to wait i don't know it all seemed like a dream and since then we have generally had everything from the confectioners and i assure you to feel that you can wash your hands of the whole thing and sit down at the head of your table with your mind as free from care as if you were a visitor is worth all the expense diana promised she would not behave like the cook and two days after this conversation left the london bridge terminus with her father and gustave lenoble mr sheldon troubled himself very little about this departure he was informed of miss paget's intended marriage and the information awakened neither surprise nor interest in his heavily burdened mind a frenchman a friend of her father's he said some swindling adventurer no doubt he thought and this was as much consideration as he could afford to bestow upon miss paget's love affairs at this present time End of chapter 4 Diana asks for a holiday